a new era begins at UFC 262 as Charles Oliveira takes on Michael Chandler for the vacant UFC lightweight title. Veteran fighter Charles Oliveira has long been a contender at 155 pounds, but recent wins over Kevin Lee and Tony Ferguson have propelled the Brazilian to the top of the heap. This guy continues to get it done. Now, do Bronx gets his shot at the gold against a man determined to spoil the party. Michael Chandler's introduction to the UFC audiences was swift and brutal. Michael Chandler, bona fide UFC lightweight contender. The American now feels more than ready to claim the mantle of king of the UFC's lightweight division. Beat me if you can. See you at the top. Will Iron Mike fulfill his destiny and claim yet another world title? Or can Du Bronx prove himself undeniable and finally seize UFC gold? Hello and welcome to UFC Inside the Octagon, where today we break down the massive, vacant, lightweight title bout between Charles Oliveira and Michael Chandler. My name is John Gooden. I am delighted to be joined by Laura Sanko for this one. Laura, it is a new era for the lightweight division. For the first time in three years, we will see a new champion. It will, of course, be between the Brazilian and the American. What say you about this main event? <laughs> it is a new era and there's something there's something exciting something fresh I feel like in the lightweight division right now for so long we had this sort of godlike figure in Habib Nurmagomedov and every storyline was built around can this person beat Habib and now we have a fresh slate we have two contenders and a vacant title and as I was thinking about um, talking about this fight, what I love about it is we have now no longer this godlike figure. We have two imperfect heroes who are looking to collide at just the right time in their career. And we will then know who is the new lightweight champion. But the fact that these guys have not had the type of career that Khabib had, you know, they're not undefeated. They both have had struggles. They both have had to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. So it's a much more relatable type of champion. It's yeah. my kind of champion. And um, I'm just so pumped for this one. Can't wait. And interestingly, and what excites me, is that we've never analyzed either of these fighters before here on Inside the Octagon. So we're going to get into that right now. Let's pull up the facts and the stats as we always do. And we have... Well, two challenges. First up, let's talk about Charles Oliveira, just 31 years of age, Laura, but joined the UFC in August of 2010. The guy's been around for so long. As we see there, most finishes in UFC history, 16 post-fight bonuses as well. We know him for submissions, and he comes into this one as a physically bigger fighter as well. He was so young when he joined the UFC, and I think sometimes we forget, I mean, I forget about it at least. I'm being reminded of it right now. He was so young when he entered the UFC, and he's really one of those fighters that has had to grow inside of the octagon, which is a difficult thing to do, but as we'll talk about, you know, as we, as we bring our analysis forth here, he's done an amazing job of it, and really, over time, added some incredible tools to his tool set, but you're right, he is the bigger fighter in this matchup, but uh, he uses his length uh, very much to his benefit, but as we'll talk about Michael Chandler, not a stranger to being the shorter fighter. So I don't know that necessarily the, the height and reach advantage will be a massive play in this fight. I think there's some other factors that might be a little bit more um, of a factor in the fight. Well, let's take a closer look at Michael Chandler then and bundles of world level experience, three time lightweight champion outside of the UFC. And this is the big one for me. Never been submitted in his pro career. That spans 27 fights. I think that might get tested. Yeah, that's a, that's an important stat to have when you're facing Charles Oliveira, who not only has all the accolades that you touched on just a second ago, but holds the record for the most submission victories in the UFC. And in fact, Indeed. just keeps breaking his own record <laughs> over and over and over, you know, creating this gap between him and the rest of, of the pack there. So, yeah, for Michael Chandler to come into this fight, having never been submitted in, in so many fights, and he has faced 
some very good grapplers in his past. You know, that, that's an important point to make here as well. So the fact that he has had that number of fights, he has faced excellent competition in the jiu-jitsu department, never has been submitted. That's, that's very important when you're facing Charles Oliveira. Yeah, looking very much forward to uh, seeing how this one shapes up. Let's get into the analysis of what we know about both of these fighters. Obviously, we have a whole lot more stuff to look at for Charles Oliveira. And let's start there, shall we? So I guess we've got to just, we've got to focus on the submission threat, right? Because the guy's got the most submissions, as you just mentioned. Interestingly as well, he's got the most styles of submissions that we've ever seen in the UFC as well, tied six with Frank Mir, and he just gets it done kind of wherever he wants, whether he's under attack, on the attack, it's just formidable. Yeah, you said it right there. I mean, it's not just that he is a submission threat. It's he's a submission threat in every respect that you can be. You know, sometimes there are fighters whose submission game is built solely around being offensive with their submission. I mean, you know that from the gate, that's all they're focused on. That's all they're doing. You know, Damian Maya, for instance, comes to mind. You knew what Damian Maya's game was every time he entered the octagon. But Charles Oliveira is a little bit more sophisticated than that because he not only can play that game where he's just out there looking for the submission, he now at this point in his career has developed such a sophisticated level of striking, a very tricky style of striking and a wrestling game that he's a true mixed martial artist. He's not just out there looking for the submission. And quite often, at this point in his career, he's much more of an opportunistic submission artist. So whether he's hunting the submission or he's creating opportunities to find a submission with his striking, uh, it's there for his taking pretty much any given opportunity and from really any position as well. As you mentioned off the top, six different submission styles. So whether he's on top, whether he's inside control, bottom half, top half, you know, he's got a calf slicer for Pete's sake. I mean, the man, <laughs> anywhere he is on the ground in a scramble, regardless of what it is, he is absolutely a submission threat. But what I like, as I mentioned a second ago, is his evolution to finding more of these opportunistic submissions, which really speaks to uh, the striking game that he has. And I think a great example of that was when he was fighting Kevin Lee. And if you'll remember... In that fight, uh, they were having some fantastic striking exchanges, but then round two came and Kevin Lee really did a phenomenal job of, of staying on top and out wrestling Charles for a lot of the second round. Um, but then in the third round, you'll see that the pace of their striking has slowed a little bit at this point. It's the third round, it's been a furious pace. But then right as soon as Kevin Lee goes in for this single leg, Charles Oliveira is immediately in on this guillotine, wasting absolutely no time and a very quick tap to boot. So you know that guillotine was in as soon as he hit it. But you look at the details. As soon as Kevin ducks his head, already, let's back it up there a second. Already, Charles Oliveira is slicing his left hand through under the chin of Kevin Lee before Kevin is even truly in on the single. He's before he's even making full contact. And then Kevin does a good job of trying to hide his head and stay very tight, but Charles Oliveira already slicing under the chin uh, to get that the, the guillotine in. But the second thing he does is as Kevin takes his right hand to grab the hip and twists Oliveira down, Charles squares up and creates this beautiful right angle uh, that allows him to, again, have the guillotine well before they hit the ground, which is why you see Kevin Lee tap so quickly. And it's not just that Charles can get any type of submission, it is the speed with which he gets to the tapping level of a submission. I mean, a lot of us, even, even people like me, can get a guillotine if someone's shooting on you, but it's truly getting a guillotine. You could get your arm in, but to be able to figure out the positioning of your legs and really have it wrapped up, I mean, that is, that's next level stuff. And I dare say that might be a level of jujitsu that Michael Chandler has not yet faced. It's, yeah, it's just exemplary ability to, to finish. And what a great equalizer against someone who decides to wrestle. And we've got to look at that. We're going to get onto him in a second. But Michael Chandler comes from a very, very good wrestling background. So you've got to think he's going to kind of use that skill set as well. But if you look at the tape, like we've just seen that you put together there, it does make you think twice. So let's turn it over to Michael Chandler then. And we've seen just a little bit 
in the octagon from him and what a performance it was. Followed it up with a magnificent post-fight speech as well. But let's talk about the specifics of his fighting style, shall we? And for the uninitiated around Michael Chandler, what are we looking at when we take his body of work? Yeah, well, if, you, if you're going to talk about the submissions of Charles Oliveira, you have to talk about the wrestling of Michael Chandler. little shout out to, uh, I'm a Missouri girl, so M-I-Z-Z-O-U coming over here. Uh, that was, of course, where Tra Michael Chandler wrestled Division One. I. I mean, phenomenal accolades. So this is, this is a true cornerstone of his fight game. Uh, but like how Charles Oliveira uses his striking to set up his submission game. Michael Chandler uses his striking to set up his wrestling, but he also uses his wrestling to set up his striking. So when you're an opponent coming in thinking about facing Michael Chandler, it's not just that you're thinking, oh, this guy's gonna shoot on me. He's got hands as well. And so they complement each other so beautifully. And if you haven't had a chance to see his work previous uh, to the UFC, that's really the bread and butter of what he brings to the table. He's got such a powerful, style of striking. He's, he grounds himself into the canvas. But what he does so sneakily is there's always that question mark. Is he about to shoot on me? Is he about to shoot on me? Or is he setting up some really big punches? And in the one beautiful piece of work that we have gotten to see in the UFC, that is precisely what he did to Dan Hooker. You know, in that fight, Chandler comes out. This is typical Michael Chandler stance, a very low stance, uh, very athletic. You can tell he's just ready to explode in at any time. And right away, he starts threatening with this, this right hand to the body and looking to show Hooker, hey, you know, I've got this right hand, it's coming for you. And constantly showing a level change going to the body, showing a level change going to the body. And then you can feel this sort of momentum building where he starts level changing more and more and you can and he does this double level change and then bam bam the right hand and the left hook come it's hard to appreciate though until you go to the slow motion and you can see michael chandler's level change he stays so low to the canvas when he lands this right hand you have to kind of back it up there for a second to see but he stays so low but then he stays down at that level and is looking at the hips of dan hooker selling I'm about to shoot in, I'm about to grab your hips, takes a right step, so he switches to southpaw, and then before Dan Hooker can even realize it, because Dan Hill's, Hooker's still looking down, he lands that beautiful left hook that is just, it spells the end of the fight, and it's a few punches later that, you know, the ref has to step in. So much in the same way that I feel like feints are part and parcel of, you know, some, when we talk about Israel Adesanya, the level changes are what allow Michael Chandler to keep his opponent constantly questioning themselves. Is he about to land a big shot or is he about to get deep on my hips and I'm about to go for a ride and he's going to end up on top? And I'm telling you what, when Michael Chandler does end up on top, he has a phenomenal top game. But how phenomenal when you consider that Charles Oliveira will try and be opportunistic, as, as you said earlier, and take a submission. And we've seen time over that he's pretty successful with doing that. I, I, at the end of the day, I think that that is what this fight comes down to, right? Um, when and if, and I do think it's more of a matter of when, they end up in this position where Michael Chandler is on top and Charles Oliveira is on bottom. How is this chess match going to play out? And I can tell you from watching Michael Chandler's uh, career prior to the UFC, he has faced really high-level grapplers before. Brent Primus and uh, Yamauchi, both amazing grapplers. Um, with Primus, he was able to get out of one of the deepest rear naked choke uh, submission temps I've seen. I mean, his face was changing colors. That The choke was so deep, but he was able to stay calm, cool, and collected, fend it off, and eventually turn the tide and win that fight. And then with Yamauchi, um, very tricky bottom game. Uh, he was able to stay on top, and he just has this amazing way of staying incredibly defensively sound. It's what wrestlers uh, who are jujitsu aware are so good at doing. He follows the hips. He never allows his opponent to be able to pivot, pivot off to mount some sort of submission offense. And he does an amazing job of covering the head. So, um, and anybody who's done jujitsu, you know that when you when your head, if you're on top in in uh, in full guard, when your head is above 
the head of your opponent beneath you, that you're winning that exchange. You've really shut down their opportunity to, uh, to mount any type of offense. So Michael Chandler, one of the best at staying defensively sound, and then on top of it, landing some nasty ground and pound in the midst of doing so. He's either all the way in, or excuse me, all the way out or all the way in. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing to watch, but even as good as Brent premises and even as good as Yamauchi is, they are not the level of grappler that Charles Oliveira is. And that to me, that's, that's the question. That's the fun part of watching this fight. And I don't have the answer. And the good news is I don't have to, because <laughs> we're going to watch it. <laughs> but the more we get into this one, the more I'm excited about these two fighting one another. Great stuff, Laura. Thank you very much. We've got so much more to look at with this one. We'll get back to it after these. Welcome back to UFC Inside the Octagon, where we're breaking down the main event for UFC 262 for the vacant lightweight title between Charles Oliveira and Michael Chandler. In part one, we took a close look at the submission threat of Charles Oliveira, which is very unique in the sense that he goes after submissions, but also can answer with his submissions. But he faces a bona fide power threat, as Dan Hooker found out in Michael Chandler, who has that wrestling threat who does use it pretty effectively we have only seen the big hands if you like already in the octagon but it's something that he's done very well throughout his career and then laura underlined that with what a great look he has against very very accomplished jiu-jitsu players a anti-jiu-jitsu style if you like when the fight hits the mat so we progress from there laura and i think it would be remiss if we didn't really tip the cap to Charles Oliveira's striking, because I believe in his more recent fights, that's what's really been getting him the W, if you like. And I, I love that old style Muay Thai from Shooter Box, but I'm wondering whether you think some of the more explosive and dynamic tricks that he's added, like the jumping front kick, for example, whether they're things that he can actually use against a fighter like Michael Chandler. Yeah, it's a great question, John, because, you know, Practical wisdom tells us, you know, you don't kick a wrestler and you don't throw flying knees against a wrestler because all of those things make it much easier for them to complete a takedown because the thought is they're always going to be shooting on you. Yeah. Um, but I think you, I think with Charles Oliveira, you have to throw that out the window, to be honest with you. His striking is so complementary to his own wrestling, his own uh, takedown defense. And as we talked about before, it, it, it sets up everything else that he does so beautifully. So I actually think in this case, he's just got to he's just got to do him. He's got to be himself and maintain that very tricky type of striking that he's shown in past fights. And I think that it's just been I don't know. It's just been incredible to see the evolution of his striking because. I think he always had good technique. He always had good footwork. He always had some nasty elbows. He, you would see glimmers of, of his striking prowess in past fights. But I would say since maybe the Tamor fight or the Lentz fight, we have really seen him sort of like own his own power. And I think the knockouts are not just coming from uh, superior footwork and excellent technique. I think it's coming from confidence and him finally believing that he was more than a jiu-jitsu player um, and more than a guy that could get it done on the ground. And he has certainly proven that with a number of knockouts recently. And I think that that's what's gotten us to where we are, right? He's always had that submission threat. You add in the striking, the knockouts, and that is why he's in this position right now, getting this title shot. And I think what you're talking about complementing the various ranges of his style, but when you're flying through the air with jumping kicks and pushing your opponent up against the fence, like Oliveira's got additional tools like body lock takedowns and things of that nature, which again just just really help him be a constant threat. Oh, absolutely. And I, I was probably most impressed by his own wrestling. And like you say, it's set up by these crazy strikes against Tony Ferguson. I mean, we don't, in the past, we hadn't seen Tony Ferguson taken down seemingly at will and certainly not by Charles Oliveira. You know, he he got in on those body lock takedowns. 
And he does such a beautiful job when he gets him from the back, he knee bumps in such a way that he immediately lands ready to take the back and get hooks in. If he's doing it from, if he's body locking from the front, he's tripping or again, knee bumping in such a way that he lands in top side control. So uh, Charles Oliveira is not a explosive folk style wrestler in the way that Michael Chandler is, but his own wrestling tools are very effective. And we have seen him start, you know, shooting some double legs. Uh, I, I don't know that he'll be doing that in this fight, but my jaw will not necessarily hit the floor if he looks for some sort of body lock takedown against Michael Chandler. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Well, flipping it over to the other side then, and how different is Michael Chandler's striking style to the shooter box Muay Thai that we see from Dubronx? It's pretty different. You know, my, as you say, Charles Dubronx, the shooter box Muay Thai, uh, a much more upright stance. He holds, you know, kind of a nice, not overly high, but sort of a, a medium tight guard for the most part. Michael Chandler, you know, for the majority of his career has trained under Henry Hooft. And so he has that very strong Dutch style of kickboxing. Uh, that lends itself to power shots. You know, you see these one, two, three, whap, 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 and then you end with a low kick type combination. And Michael Chandler's striking is really rooted predominantly in his stance. Uh, the way that he athletically like roots himself to the canvas produces the power that you see in his hands, the hooks, the straight shots, all of that comes from this very low center of gravity in this athletic base that he keeps. But that athletic base is also, I think, in some ways, what he has to be very careful of. Not that you want to take it out of his game, but we have seen him in, in that first Brent Primus fight. You know, that's how the fight ended. He took a leg kick uh, right above the knee, hit the peroneal nerve, and got drop foot like we've seen these other fighters uh, get recently, whether it's Sean O'Malley um, or uh, Jimmy Crute most recently, he took one kick and you could tell that from then on, I mean, his ankle was just shot. So he is in some ways susceptible um, as anybody would be, but particularly in that very athletic stance where he's putting a lot of weight on that front foot, he is susceptible to the leg kicks. So he's gonna have to stay very defensively sound in that way. And also just in terms of counters, Charles Oliveira does an amazing job of finding the right openings and being very surgical with his straight shots, uh, which was, you know, Chandler's undoing against Patricio Pitbull. So there are openings, but I'd say in large part, Chandler brings a, a very heavy striking game that sets up the wrestling and the rest from there. And talk about motivation for these two <laughs> lightweights, right? Charles Oliveira, as yeah. we've said, like hammering it home. The, the amount of time he's been with the organization, the, the ups and downs in his career, his people from Sao Paulo, uh, bringing Brazilian jiu-jitsu to the masses, such a lot carried on his shoulders, but also imbuing him with this sense of, you know, becoming such a great champion. And, and then on the other side, Michael Chandler, coming over to the UFC and making a splash. It's it's so, listen, I love the Habib era, truly did, but it is nice and refreshing for, for analysts and, and commentators like you and I to talk about these different protagonists. It is, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's a whole new, it's a fresh page, it's a whole new chapter and, it kind of gets you excited again to think about matchups and it, it just sort of, it takes the whole top of that lightweight division. You just, you know, shake it, shake it in a bottle and throw it out on the table and any matchup you get would oh. be phenomenal. And we've got another one on this card. There's of course, Poirier, you know, versus Connor two coming up or three, I guess, coming yeah. up. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got Justin Gaethje kind of, you know, looking like Pablo Escobar sitting alone on his swing out there in Narcos. Uh, so, Really, any any way you look, it's it's impossible not to see a phenomenal fight on the horizon in this lightweight division. Yep, love it. A new champion will be crowned at UFC 262. Laura, thank you very much for your input and your expertise. You can keep the conversation going using the hashtag inside the Octagon tweets at UFC Europe. Enjoy this one. It will be spectacular. And we'll see you for the next pay-per-view.